All right, guys, Murph's here. And today we're gonna go over episode five of my World War II rifle comparison series with this. A US rifle, 30 caliber, M1, also known as, colloquially, the M1 Garand chambered in 30 out six. Now, before we get into this video, I do wanna go ahead and conduct a little bit of expectation management. So, guys, I, this is not a big channel. I do not have sponsors providing me ammunition. I do not have access to the private collections of collectors or museums or anything along those lines. I'm not going to necessarily, I'm not at the point of being able to give you guys the same level of content as perhaps CNR Arsenal or Forgotten Weapons. CNR Arsenal's been killing it on the World War One battlefront there, going over everything utilized in World War One, all small arms, and I can't wait for them to start World War II because they put together a fantastic product that I hope to be that I that I aspire to be able to reach at some point. But it's not in the cards at the moment. What I do have access to is a friend's collection of military surplus rifles, and among that collection, I've been able to select one weapon system per country major player you could say of world war ii so that's what we're going over we're going over one rifle per country a sample size of one per rifle in order to kind of talk about pros cons benefits and throw it onto a number scale in order to be able to enumerate where these rifles are good and bad or bad's bad's the wrong word where they excel and where they have a little bit of struggle all right now in addition to that guys i am long-winded and i know that and these videos have been getting progressively longer. So if you're in a hurry, which I understand, go ahead and check the description. And there I will have annotated where different parts of the video start up. Time is precious, guys. And I'm not looking to take any more of your time than what you want to get me. So hit the description. Go ahead and jump to the parts of the video that you want to watch. Get the information that you're here to get. And then go on about your day. I hope at some point in the future you come back and finish the rest of the video, but I don't even like listening to me talk for 45 minutes plus, so I can't imagine how you guys put up with it. All right, so with those things out of the way, let's go ahead and hop into some history. Now, during World War I, we saw the first fielding of semi-automatic rifles in combat. Now, that might surprise some people, and that is because not enough rifles were ever really fielded in order to like decisively sway a battle or something along those lines. Just World War I is an instance where every technological advancement was being used or tried or developed in order to be able to break the stalemate and end the war. Now, unlike the other technological advancements that came out of World War I, the semi-automatic rifle didn't necessarily benefit from a wide amount of development post-war and in the interwar period, as I've been referring to it as. So, a lot of the other countries decided that eh, that semi-automatic thing really isn't that great. And I, I think a lot of it comes down to a concept of this returning to individual marksmanship. And you saw the same kind of thing whenever magazine rifles were being adopted in the 1800s where, you know, oh, well, we can't give them that much ammunition on tap. Otherwise, our soldiers will just expend all the ammunition at like five minutes in the battle and then he ain't going to have any bullets. And conflict kind of proved that wrong in all honesty. But that same concern was present with semi-automatic rifles. If you just made it to where a guy could empty a magazine as fast as he can pull his trigger, then he's gonna run out of bullets too fast. and We can't have that be the situation. So what a lot of countries would do, and, and we, we see this all the time in the interwar period, we get ready for, you know, we go into a combat, right? We go into combat and we're like, this is what combat's gonna look like. And then you get there and you find out that's not what combat looks like at all. So we need to adjust our TTPs and strategies and all that kind of stuff, maybe develop some new stuff to be able to fight this war because it's not like the last war, as it turns out. Well, then you get to the other side of that war, you win the war, and then you decide that next time War is going to be fought like this. This is how all this is going to go down. This, this, these are the rules. And then you get into the next war, and it turns out that the guys you're fighting didn't apparently read the rule book, and they're not fighting the way you thought you would, and you're right back to square one of having to start all over again and figure out new TTPs. We do it every time. We're presently doing it now in, in, in the United States. So it happens. Anyway. So most countries in Europe would decide that instead of adopting semi-automatic rifles, they would develop better bolt-action rifles, perhaps go away from long rifle and carbine-type setups and go to just a universal 
short rifle concept and, and things along that line. And that makes sense for countries that hadn't yet adopted short rifles. However, the US and the UK had already adopted short rifles and aside from maybe updating sites and all that kind of stuff, they didn't really see a need to develop them any further. So these two countries would start their own semi-automatic rifle programs. Now the British would decide that they wanted to kind of build it around the short magazine Lee Enfield and either be able to use existing stocks of short magazine Lee Enfields to be able to adapt to semi-automatic rifles or have bolt-on pieces to Lee Enfields to turn them into semi-automatic rifles. And this was met with kind of mixed results and it kind of pittered out, especially as we get closer to World War II heating up. However, the US decided that they would build a rifle from the ground up to be semi-automatic. So the call is put out, the requirements are put out, and a lot of different manufacturers and designers start putting together different weapon systems. Now guys, when it comes to the subject of the development of the M1 Garand, that is a whole video all by itself, and it's not necessarily what I want to get into. There, there's some content out there, Forgotten Weapons has some stuff. If that's something that really interests you, go ahead and check out Ian McCollum's content. It's excellent. So I'm going to kind of gloss over a lot of these aspects, but I do want to talk about a couple of key points and wave tops of some pretty significant parts of the development process. Now, right off the bat, we have a gentleman named John Garand who starts working at Springfield Arsenal and starts turning his attention to the semi-automatic rifle concept. Now, you'll notice that I called this a Garand and the designer a Garand, or, and said the designer's name Garand. The proper pronunciation is Garand. However, you can understand how somebody, how it's, I mean, it's not even just somebody, how everybody makes a mistake just looking at it written on a piece of paper that it would be pronounced Garand, especially with the lack of like, you know, any type of marking to indicate what emphasis you're supposed to put on which syllables. So with that being the case, the rifle is most commonly referred to as a Garand, and there are some people who get very upset and pretentious about the proper pronunciation pronunciation of the rifle. And it's not necessarily something that I deal in because I, I kind of think the whole thing's silly. I know what you're talking about regardless of what you call it. You know what I'm talking about regardless of what I call it. Just, just, just continue with the conversation. At this point, this rifle's kind of at the, the level of, um, well, you, you make a new friend and, you know, gets introduced to you as whatever nickname, right? And that's how you refer to that person. That's how you think about that person. That's how you introduce that person to other people. That's how you have them saved in your phone and all that kind of stuff. And then one day somebody calls that person by their first name and you realize like, oh man, I never really considered that this guy might have a given name. That's kind of where we're at with the Garand. All right, anyway, out of that rabbit hole. So. One of the biggest things about developing semi-automatic rifles is figuring out what type of system you're gonna to use to make it semi-auto. Now, today we have a lot of hindsight going on here, right? And we have a ton of different semi-automatic rifles out on the market, hi Brett, out on the market and a ton of different designs that have been proven out over time. And we can sit here looking back and go, why didn't they just do this? Why didn't they just do that? And there's a couple of things that play into it. So. These are new, this is a new concept. So how do we make it work? Well, there were semi-automatic rifles out on the market at the time. And a lot of them were using the inertia system of operation, which is a complicated and rather heavy system of springs and all that kind of stuff. And you see it in the Remington Model 8 as well as in shotguns, the Remington Model 11. And the Army knows they don't wanna go with that because that's heavy. And as much as like this is not a light rifle by any means, it could be heavier. Like the best decisions to, in order to have a good cross section between reliability, durability, and weight were made, especially when you have to consider that a lot of these rifles are gonna be produced. So there's a cost aspect that has to be considered. We're in the 1920s and 30s right now with the, our discussion on this particular rifle. The extensive use of polymers is not yet common. If you went back to the 30s right now and told people that guns were going to be made out of plastic in the future, they, it would blow their minds. The, the thing that my kid's toy is made out of is going to be what contains the pressures that are involved in shooting a gun? That can't be. No way. In addition, aluminum alloys and all that type of stuff, that's not a commonplace thing. And even if it were to be developed and made more available, it would be expensive and you're only worth so much money to the army as it turns out. So, when you need it to be reliable and durable and lightweight and all that kind of stuff, something's gotta give. And at this time, wood and steel are incredibly, like that's, that's a fixed point. This is made out of enough metal to make it 
durable and reliable, no more, no less. Same with the wood stock, and that's kind of the fixed point you're stuck with when it comes to weight. So if we can get a lighter operating system with fewer moving parts or whatever it may be, then we can lighten up the rifle that way. That's how it's gotta go. So with that being the case, how do we make it operate? Now, a lot of different things were utilized, and we are gonna kind of gloss over a lot of it. There were primer actuated systems, which I'd be very interested to see, blowback operation, all that kind of stuff, but blowback has its own weight prohibition uh, associated with it. So finally, how do we harness the gases? You know, we already fired the bullet and there's gases pushing it down. How do we harness those gases? So what's initially looked at is a gas trap system, which is where you have an attachment that goes around the end of the muzzle, which will capture those gases that explode out of the end of the muzzle after the bullet exits. You need to, of course, have a hole cut so that the bullet can exit out of that. And then that gas pressure is used to operate the system. That's what's initially being very successful. Now, the question might be, why not just drill a hole in the barrel like is normal like why are they making this so complicated that is because at this time there's actually a concern about drilling holes in barrels as to whether or not the metallurgy at the time would be able to make that a successful approach and not have the gun come apart not have that be a significant point of failure there's a lot of concern about this and that's why you see gas trap designs in the 20s 30s into the 40s still being very popular because there's some concern about compromising the integrity of the barrel We'll get more into this here in a little bit. So we know that right now we're looking at gas trap designs. What about how do we feed it? Well, initially there was some discussion about going to a detachable box magazine. However, the issue with detachable box magazines is that they might get discarded on the battlefield and then you have to supply more of them. And again, today that doesn't sound like all that big of a deal. I mean, we got, you know, mag poles and hell, even GI magazines are, you know, plentiful and you can just who cares? Toss them. You know, you're in the middle of a firefight, go ahead and drop the magazine, go to your next one. No big deal. During this time, though, that's not the same thing. We're at a point in magazine design where magazines are not, are not considered discardable items. You sign for those. Those go with the rifle. And a lot of that has to do with uh, manufacturing at the time, especially if you had a reliable magazine that works with the gun you're using it in, you kept it with the gun. In addition to that, the amount of cost associated with being able to make something durable, reliable, and then also be expendable, that's expensive. And that's not just expensive in like buying the amounts, but also in materials used. World War I very quickly showed a lot of people that production and then material availability were major factors in large scale conflicts like that. If another one of those kicked off, now, you know, bombs, bullets, grenades, all that type of stuff, that's one time use metals. You're not getting those back. Now add in magazines, and that's another strain that's being placed on the raw materials utilized to be able to make guns, howitzers, all that kind of stuff. Kind of a big deal if you look at it that way. So box, detachable box magazines are immediately rejected. Instead, they decide to go with a clip system. And that's why these systems are so popular at this time because strip clips, or in this case, end block clips are cheap to produce. They're simple to produce, they don't have a huge strain on resources, and they can be discardable. These would come preloaded with eight rounds for this particular setup. And you, it didn't matter if they got left out on the battlefield or, or even a training range or something along those lines because you could get more of these. It wasn't a big issue. So. That is why the M1 Garand utilizes an M-block clip. Now, a lot of people seem to like to think that the M1 Garand is the first one to ever use an M-block clip, and that is not the case. The M-block concept far predates the M1 Garand all the way out into the 1870s. So, there's a lot of reason to go with this concept right off the bat. We'll talk more about this, this little piece of metal here in a bit. Now, so we've got gas up we got our operating system and then our magazine system what about cartridge so initially of course this would be based around the 30-06 which is already in service at the time however a 276 caliber offering would kind of work its way in there and start competing next to the M next to the 30-06 and actually doing quite well so when it all came together when a when the trials were complete and they made their recommendation on up the chain for what it is that was wanted, it was a 10 shot M block clip gas trap operated 276 caliber semi-automatic rifle. And that is what made it to General MacArthur's desk and he took a look at it and said no. 
He did not like the 276 cartridge because we already had a massive stockpile of M2 30-06 ammunition lying around. Why would we change our cartridge? Have to get rid of all that old stuff and then generate a brand new stockpile of an all-new cartridge. I would have thought that an interwar period was the time to do that, but MacArthur did not agree. And I think some of that might come down to perhaps the 276 did not effectively outperform the 30-06 to be a technological advancement that was the army was willing to spend the money on. So what he did approve, however, was additional time and money being given to the program in order to be able to develop a fully functional, to the same level functional 30-06 variant of that rifle. And that is what got adopted in 1936. Now, you will note that this rifle is not a gas trap rifle. And that is because just a few years later, it was decided that the gas trap system was not effective enough. And instead, they would drill a hole in the barrel, provide a gas port, and bleed off gases that way. And all, and those rifles would be changed up to the new standard. Now, something to keep in mind in general, guys, is it's extremely hard to find an all parts matching M1 Garand. They have been, all of them have been arsenal fixed more than once. And that's why you see kind of a lot of different things intermixed in these rifles, different manufacturers, uh, different years of parts, because there are also a lot of little tiny changes that are made all throughout that didn't necessarily constitute a complete redesign of the rifle. So if someone walks up to you and says that they have a gas trap M1 Garand for sale, you need to be concerned about that. You need to treat them with um, a little bit of suspicion until it's confirmed by somebody else that it's actually real because most of those rifles have been modified and a lot of any of the rifles that exist now are in like museum collections and stuff like that. There's not a whole lot of them just floating around out in the open. Now, this rifle would reach full military service by 1941 and would serve faithfully in World War II with a lot of love from the troops. Patton himself would proclaim this the finest battle implement ever devised. Now, during the war, there were a couple of minor changes made, and this is actually comes into an interesting discussion about nomenclature. So, during the development of this rifle, there was a nomenclature shift. Prior to World War II, and really somewhere in the 1920s or 30s, I'm not entirely sure where the shift occurred, rifles were designated by the year that they were adopted, so the 1903 Springfield this 1905 bayonet, all that kind of stuff. And then there would be an alphanumeric code following it for any changes that were made, A1, A2, so on and so forth. However, this is an M1. Why is that? It wasn't made near one. And that is because we switched our designation over to each classification of an item now having a designation model one. And then the next model after that would be a two, so on and so forth. So that would then have any alphanumeric if there was just a minor change without a complete redesign going on. So an M1, A1, all that kind of stuff. And that's why you have an M1 rifle and an M1 carbine. Two different families there with their own adjustments and all that kind of stuff that follows it, which is why you have an M1, A1 carbine. And eventually there's an M2 carbine, M1, uh, M1 submachine gun, all that kind of stuff. That is how that designation works. Now, during the war, we would see a little weird thing where we would have an M1C and an M1D. Well, what are those? Those don't really follow that matrix. And I don't have a good answer, but I have a guess. And my guess is that those rifles did not reach full production and mass distribution, so they did not necessarily get their own alphanumeric identifier. So what are those rifles? Well, those are sniper variants of the M1 Garand. The M1C would be receivers identified at the manufacturer who would then have a hole drilled in the receiver in order to be able to mount the uh, scope mount and then the receivers would be reheat treated. Now, unfortunately, in the heat treating process, they would get, sometimes, they would get warped. However, it wasn't too big of a deal because the Marine Corps would adopt the M1C as their sniper rifle in 1951. Now, the M1D was a bolt-on application to where you would take, you would remove or in some way modify the rear sight of the M1 Garand, and then you would bolt on all the other parts, the scope mount and all that kind of stuff in order to turn it into an M1D. And that would include a flash hider that would go here and would attach to the bayonet lug there. 
1945, the war ends. We have a massive surplus of M1 Garands. So these rifles would wind up getting sent to a lot of our allies, the French, Belgians, all those types of people. However, just a couple years later in 1951, Korea would kick off and this rifle would once again hit mass production. Now, quite a few people manufactured the M1 Garand during both World War, World War II and Korea. So Winchester, of which this is a Winchester produced rifle, International Harvester, Harrington and Richardson, as well as Remington. I mean, so many, so many people produced M1 Garands. It's kind of difficult to keep up with. Now, during World War II, we also, I, I forgot to mention this in kind of variants, we also had an experimental tanker rifle as well as a jungle rifle. And these were the T-25 and T-26. T, in this case, being a designation for experimental with a E coming afterwards, identifying it being an experimental variation. So a T26E1 would have been akin to an M26A1 in the same overall nomenclature approach. Now, these rifles would be uh, cut down to 18 inches and never saw full production. So if you ever see somebody who claims that they have a Tinker M1 Garand, know that it is an after war adaptation. Somebody took a 22 inch barreled M1 Garand and then adjusted it down to a 20, to an 18 inch barreled M1 Garand. So, or something along those lines. It's not, it is unlikely that it's the super rare experimental version of this rifle. Now, between Korea and World War II, 5.4 million of these rifles were produced. That's a lot. However, it would be retired in 1957 for the M14. And you would see these rifles go out to all kinds of allies after the 1950s to where it, they would wind up in Greece, Vietnam, French Indochina in the hands of French soldiers prior to that, Korea, all these different places. This rifle just winds up going everywhere and it goes out on the Lend-Lease Program. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Lend-Lease Program is a agreement that the United States military has, or the United States government has with a whole bunch of other foreign governments that we will provide them weapons with the understanding that they will come back so we don't wind up fighting our own guns at some point. And when these rifles come back, they get put into a program known as the CMP, or Civilian Marksmanship Program, which is a program set up by the government in order to promote safe firearms handling and shooting fundamentals in the civilian populace. And that is where you find the majority of these rifles today. The CMP goes through, they refit rifles that maybe have some stuff broken about them, get them back up to military standard, and then they sell them. They got a whole price chart that goes along with them, and they're an absolutely excellent program. In order to get into the program, you have to be a member of like a shooting club or something along those lines. You, you, you can look it up. We're not gonna do a full CMP review here, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting program, and this is actually a hand select from the Anniston, Georgia location of the CMP. Now, this rifle, of course, is exceedingly popular in the U.S. market. We're just getting all the animals today, aren't we? In the U.S. market, it has been very popular in pop culture, in movies like Saving Private Ryan, video games like uh, Call of Duty and all that kind of stuff. A lot of us grew up seeing these rifles in different pop culture references. I'm going to need those in a minute. So, I think that pretty much covers history, guys. So let's go ahead and start talking about features. All right, we have a 22-inch barreled rifle. We have our bayonet lug located right here. We have our front sight, which has protective ears, located right here. We have a stacking swivel right there. This does take the 1905 bayonet, which is a knife-type bayonet. Go ahead and take that off there before I poke my eye out. Now, we have hand guards, of course, to keep from burning our fingies in the middle of combat. We have a GI sling attached here. Let's go ahead and get back and talk about our action. So, of course, we have our action here. This is the magazine location. This is what the clip feeds into. This would hold eight rounds. It would be inserted in through the top. The important thing to remember whenever you load these is to keep 
your knife hand going down the side, which is going to arrest the potential forward movement of the charging handle. Sometimes these bolts don't lock all the way back properly and are actually sitting against the follower. So when you start to try to feed ammunition into it and depress the follower, that allows the bolt to fly forward and potentially tries to chamber your thumb, which is a condition known as grand thumb. That's why you want to avoid that. Now you can load less than eight rounds into one of these clips. It's, it's kind of a pain because they, they try to move around and fall all over the place, but you can load three, four, how, however many rounds you want to into this magazine. You can also single load these by pushing a round all the way up into the chamber and then holding back the bolt, depressing the follower and riding that all the way in the battery. Now, some people also like to claim that you can't top these up. You, you kind of can. It's a very involved process and it's probably easier to just eject the ammunition, which is done by holding open the action and depressing this button located here on the side of the receiver. Now, let's go ahead and talk about one of the other popular theories, and that is the M1 Garand <laughs> ping. So, it was a, it's been a commonly expressed belief that the issue with the M1 Garand is that when the last round was fired, this clip is ejected along with the empty brass, and it makes a very distinctive pinging noise when it does that. And it has been often asserted that the enemy would hear that and then they would know that your gun was empty and that was when they would come charging in to take the hill. However, there's a couple of things that don't make a lot of sense about that. First off, it doesn't take very long to reload one of these guns. In addition to that, just because your gun ran dry doesn't mean the guy next to you's gun ran dry. Or, you know, the machine gun nearby ran dry. Something along those lines. So, it's not very helpful unless you're in some sort of like really weird one-on-one -on -one battle with somebody in a very in fairly close proximity, close enough for them to be able to hear the ping, and like, yeah, okay, fine, then it could be an issue, but that's also why you have a bayonet. So, there's that. Now, in addition to that, I don't know a lot of things, but I do know a little bit about combat. I know that it's quite loud. You've got explosions and gunshots and all this kind of stuff, and like, that pinging noise would be really difficult to isolate and track down. Like, I don't I don't think it really had as much to do with anything as a lot of people like to try to assert. I, I don't I don't think anyone I, I don't think that was a TTP on the enemy side to be like, ah, oh, the ping, charge. I, I, that just doesn't make a lot of sense overall. I can see the concern, I can understand why you might think that, but I don't think it's actually based in reality in this case. In the words of Clint Smith, you just fired eight rounds of 30 out six. Everybody's deaf. Nobody nobody's hearing that. All right, now we have our rear sight here, which is adjustable for windage and elevation and can be graduated out to 1200 yards. We have our trigger guard down here, which is one of the differences along with the rear sights. There would be some updates to rear sights throughout production. And then also this being a machined trigger guard, you would eventually see closer to the end of the war, a switch over to a stamped type trigger guard. Now in the front of our trigger guard is our safety. You pull it back for safe, bring it forward for fire. And let's see, we have our lovely wooden stock here. Very nice wood. And we have a semi pistol grip built into it, which is excellent for pulling it into your shoulder. We have a fairly short length of pull in all actuality, which is kind of surprising. On the back, we have a steel butt plate, which has a trap door in it for your cleaning kit. And I think that pretty much covers features, guys. So let's go ahead and move over, move over. Bleh, why? I, I run words together there. Why don't we move over into our grading criteria? So for grading, we're going to talk about four different categories, and they are going to be ergonomics, features, firepower, and accuracy. And each one of these is going to be worth five points with a possible 20 points overall. So let's go ahead and talk about ergonomics. Well guys, we don't have a lot to talk about in ergonomics with this rifle. Um, sling placement's not my favorite. I kind of like side mounted slings, but that's not like, I guess it's kind of neither here nor there in this case. I do like the semi pistol grip for pulling it into my shoulder. And though it's got a short length of pull, I don't find it, I don't feel too bunched up with it. 
And I've also got plenty of real estate to be able to grip. That's good, good real estate to be able to control the rifle. So otherwise, it's kind of laid out like any other semi-automatic rifle. I just don't have a, a large bolt handle or anything hanging off the side, which is kind of nice. So with that being the case, I'm going to give this a 3 out of 5. I'm going to need those in a minute. Just, you know, it's gonna, anyway, so now let's go ahead and talk about features. So features wise, so in a lot of ways, this has very comparable features like setup and layout to what we would already find in bolt action rifles. However, its most prominent feature is the fact that it's semi-automatic, is this gas system and all this kind of stuff. Because even among other semi-automatic rifles that get fielded during World War II, this rifle stands out. It is an excellent layout. It's an excellent design. This is better overall. So, this is a this 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 single thing plays a huge part into features. Otherwise, you know, okay, cool. Well, I've got a button to be able to eject the ammunition. That that was going to be present regardless. I mean, you you have the ability to be able to quickly remove ammunition from pretty much every rifle that we've talked about so far. So that's not a big deal. There's there's not a whole lot else that stands out about this rifle aside from the gas system, which literally pretty much accounts for all of the positive points I'm about to give this gun. Now, also in features, this bayonet is an excellent bayonet as far as actually fighting with it like a knife if you had to. Um, having a cross guard, nice grip and all that kind of stuff. Far better than socket type bayonets. Can't stand socket type bayonets. So, with that, for features, I'm going to give this rifle a 4 out of 5. It's pretty good. It's pretty good overall. Now, firepower. This is where we get a lot of fun. So, 8 rounds in the magazine. Not our highest capacity, but I can feed it at one time with a single clip. All that ammunition goes in at the same time. So, it's kind of beating out the number 4 Enfield in that manner. And then in addition to that, it's beating all of the bolt action rifles because I can send rounds down range as fast as I can pull this trigger. That's, that's nice. So, and it, it's especially nice whenever we talk about this kind of dynamic, right, of like preparing for the wars that you're actually going to fight and all that kind of stuff. World War II becomes a very heavy emphasis on utilizing overwhelming suppressive fire in order to be able to maneuver to within grenade range or something along those lines to be able to destroy the enemy. So it's not... It's not this single lone rifleman concept. It is you are working in a team and whoever puts out the most ammunition, the fastest on target, gets to maneuver and destroy that target. Like it's it's a very it's a it's a comprehensive overall thing. You we see combined fires for the first time. So bringing in our you know, radio in artillery or or bringing in strafing runs and all that kind of stuff like there's a lot that goes into this instead of just taking well-aimed shots at somebody who apparently is exposing themselves and silhouetting against the skyline or something along those lines. Other countries solve this in other ways, and they put a heavier emphasis on machine guns. The, the MG42 gets wide distribution in the German military, and you pretty much have a whole bunch of riflemen who are just supposed to like provide ammunition you know, keep supplying the MG42 ammunition and then keep the MG42 from getting attacked from the sides. The British put a heavy emphasis on everybody carrying ammunition for the Bren so that they can keep the Brens in action. The Americans decided that we'll give everybody semi-automatic rifles and then the machine guns got plenty of time to do, you know, change barrels, reload, and all that kind of stuff because riflemen are going to be able to keep the pressure on the enemy. Now, of course, we had the BAR as well, and, you know, that, that was down at the squad level, but I would actually be very interested to see a comparison, like a side-by-side -side comparison of this and a BAR to see who could put more firepower on target faster. Because like a BAR is great and all that kind of stuff, but recoil management's kind of difficult with a full-size rifle cartridge like that. And you, you wind up having to shoot fairly short bursts. So great, you got a 20 round magazine, but this is really fast reloading and it's a lot easier to keep on target and shoot quickly. It's a comparison I would like to do. However, I don't have a BAR. So if someone out there with a BAR wants to uh, wants to loan it to me so that I can do that comparison, I would not say no. For sure, would not say no. So, with that being the case, firepower is a 5 out of 5. If I could, 
I would give it a six out of five. Like this is just, this is excellent. This is kind of the epitome of firepower in the individual infantryman's hands. And also being able to extend out to range. Cause like, of course the Thompson carries more ammunition, but it's kind of limited in range. Whereas this has great range and it has faster follow-up shots and all that kind of stuff. So now let's talk about accuracy. Now all of our accuracy testing in this series is done off of 25 yards because I had some issues with the Mauser 98K for the first video where we were having trouble getting it on paper at 100 and all I had was the rapid group that I shot at the start of the day to make sure we were on paper at 25 yards. So all the testing or all the comparison is done at 25 yards shot at a fairly rapid pace. With this rifle, and keep in mind guys, so I fire three rounds to make sure that we're like on paper and I, I, I know what my holdovers or hold unders are, and then I fire five rounds after that. And that's all that gets shot for the rifle for uh, comparison type purposes. So here, right here, is our M1 Garand group at 25 yards. And that measures in at two and three eighths inches. And we can see that in contrast to the Arasaka's group right next to it at an inch and a quarter. So how does that compare to the other rifles? Well, that puts it right in line with the number four Mark I with the two and three eighths inch group right there. It beats out the Mosin Nagant with a two and seven eighths inch group. And it solidly beats the Mauser 98K with its like six inch group, but still loses to the Type 99. So grouping wise, it's kind of it's kind of middle ground. Now, these sites are excellent sites. This site picture is absolutely amazing. It's my favorite out of all of them. I love how these ears are set up, how they kind of bow out to the sides. It makes it it presents for a very nice, clean site picture. The adjustment on them, I love how adjustable these sites are. They're incredibly easy to zero and work with, and all this kind of stuff. And again, the sights kind of almost fly in the face of how these rifles actually get utilized. So these rifles are still very popular in like long range shooting matches and all that kind of stuff against, you know, gigantic targets that don't actually represent a man sized target nor combat conditions trying to actually identify somebody to shoot who doesn't want to get shot. So I think in some ways they're a little over designed, but they're excellent to work with and I have no actual complaints. N nothing, nothing that like makes sense to complain about overall with these sites. They're, they, are my favorite of the sites that we reviewed so far. Now, when it comes to shooting this rifle, uh, I shot all these rifles exactly how they're zeroed, right? So in order to get this grouping closer to the target that I was actually shooting at, I actually had to hold here, like right around in this area, which means that I was actually obscuring my target in order to be able to see the impacts. And that's a thing that can happen with how these rifles are zeroed and all that kind of stuff. You might be in a scenario where you can't as favorably view your target for the distance that you're shooting at. So that's that's kind of that's kind of how the outcome of that group came out. So with that being the case, I'm going to give this rifle a 3 out of 5. Now, unless I'm off on my math, I believe that overall gives this rifle a 15 out of 20 for grading criteria. All right, guys. Well, that's uh, these are my thoughts on the M1 Garand. I really do like this rifle. These are absolutely fantastic. I am just as guilty as everyone else is of being an M1 Garand fanboy. Are you mad at me now? Really? So I'm a, I'm a big fan of the M1 Garand. I think this is an excellent rifle, and it definitely deserves to kind of stand above a lot of some of the other rifles that we've talked about so far when it comes to actual battlefield application as opposed to individual merits like how this gun the things that make this gun really good make this gun really good it's not necessarily like some sort of whiz bang thing was thrown on here in order to be able to make it better than everything else just by solid design this rifle stands out now something i do want to talk about before i go this rifle does have an aftermarket gas plug installed 
And that is because this rifle was originally built for M2 ball ammunition and the pressure curve and spike and all that kind of stuff that you find with it. When you buy these rifles and they have the standard gas plug in them, they are not meant to be fired with hunting type ammunition or any of the more modern ammunition. Even if it's 150 grain, it does not mean that it has the same pressure profile as the M2 ball cartridge. And though it may not necessarily do it in one round, if you fire multiple rounds through the gun, you will eventually damage the operating rod. So that is why if you want to shoot a wider variety of ammunition through the gun, which makes sense, I understand 30-06 is not necessarily always available in M1 Garand rated ammunition, you need to swap out that, that gas plug there. You, you need to make that change. Go ahead and invest into it. It's not a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's very easy to do, and it's going to be far cheaper than trying to fix whatever it is that you damaged running the wrong ammunition through this rifle. All right, guys, I think that pretty much covers my thoughts here. Uh, this video, actually, I think might be one of the shortest that I've done yet. So, that being the case, guys, have a good day.